Uh, good afternoon. Uh, what a uh, very generous introduction, uh, and I uh, am very grateful for that, and I'm uh, so honoured to uh, be asked to speak uh, at such an organisation with a, a rich uh, history, albeit, uh, I may say, a relatively young one still. Uh, and uh, having heard those words about my name, uh, I, for the second time this week, uh, my sadly... Uh, departed father of now eight years ago would have been very proud uh, to have heard that himself. Um, I say the second because uh, earlier this week I, I, I think I achieved um, uh, what, what uh, in many ways I think has become the, the greatest thing of my life. Um, I, I'm sure many of you have, have come across the, the long-running British quiz program University Challenge. Yeah. And I don't, do you get it here by any... <laughs> So I was at a dinner for a client on Monday night and my BlackBerry started ringing rather with greater frequency than it normally does. And I thought, oh my God, it sounds like something's going wrong somewhere in the world. <laughs> and I, and I, so I looked at the thing before I was going to speak and a couple of my old university pals saying, you are not going to believe what's just happened. That um, the, uh, Jeremy Paxman, about halfway through the program, asked... Jim O'Neill created the phrase brick, what does it stand for? <laughs> so I actually featured in University Challenge. <laughs> uh, which is quite embarrassing, but uh, most amusing. So it, it is very, very nice to be here, and uh, it, as I say, a great honor. So I thought what I'd do is, is in the context of using some pictures, uh, try to outline for 20 <clears throat> minutes or so some of the... Some of the big issues that relate to this remarkable thing that I happen to have stumbled across and then leave as much time as possible for, uh, for questions. <clears throat> uh, I should also add that the uh, wonderful human being Peter Sutherland, uh, a dear colleague of mine for many years at Goldman, was absolutely paranoid about me coming here because he thought I might say something that would get him into trouble about European Monetary Union. So I apologize, Peter, and I apologize to all of you in advance. So I, 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 let me add another apology because I'm sure at the back of the room you probably can't see this very clearly, can you? I know if I was, well, actually quite a few of you are quite young. If I, if I was even sitting halfway, I wouldn't be able to see it. So. Anyhow, so to start, to start with, and how I put it in, in modern context, and of course, actually for Ireland, as it is for the UK and many other post-crisis-influenced uh, economies, uh, aspects of this is, is so important for you to think about, in my opinion. Um, I, I, be, I believe, um, and have done now for about a year <coughs> or so, uh, in my relatively new life as chairman of this asset management company, that from a, from a business perspective, not, not just finance, but for, for all business, uh, to think of these eight countries uh, that you see in this right-hand blue pie chart, the four BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, uh, together with uh, Mexico, Korea, Turkey, and Indonesia, those eight, to think of them as traditional emerging markets in the way that business has thought of them uh, since essentially uh, the 1970s when they stopped being referred to as LDCs, remember those days? Uh, I, I think it's just silly, uh, as I'll try to show you in a minute. These eight countries are collectively driving the world economy. And if, if any of us are going to have uh, a prosperous future, particularly from small open economies, Getting involved in stuff that these guys need and want is what our lives are going to be all about. And, and I think it is therefore uh, inopportune as a business person uh, to think of them as traditional emerging markets because the scale of what they offer is of a dimension which is very different from what we in my generation would think in our minds of an emerging market. Uh, and it is becoming so important, it's almost to the point of it, I think, being sort of socially rude to describe these places as emerging markets. If you, if, if you t and so I, I was sitting around for ages trying to think, what, what do you call this? And the, the thing that started me off, which also led to me writing uh, my first book ever, which for those of you who have done it, is a somewhat weird experience, particularly when you have a day job. It's uh, 
not something I would rush to repeat, I'd quickly add, but I was on a, a long trip to uh, China, India, and ended up in South Korea for the best part of two weeks in late 2010. And I'm going to come back to touch on South Korea a couple of times. And even myself as, as Mr. Brick, I, I, I just, when I was on the way back, I, 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 I thought, I, even I, I, have, I just cannot comprehend the scale uh, and degree of change that's going on here. Uh, and I mentioned Korea because it's the first time I've been in Korea for a number of years. Uh, and uh, and I'll, I'll come back to another aspect of this, but Korea's ability to change and develop and to link into those countries, uh, it, it's easier for them because they're sort of in the middle of Asia, but it's a sort of, of an example to so many of the rest of us in my judgment uh, about how to think of these things. And, and I, 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 I kept thinking about all three, why do we call them emerging markets, particularly for Korea? Uh, and that's what led me to this thing, well, let's call them something else, and my something else is growth markets. If you take those eight and put them back in the left-hand pie chart, you can see partly already the, the, the importance of how I distinguish them, because those eight are nearly now 25% of global GDP, uh, and which is double all the rest of the emerging world put together. So the scale of these countries is just of a dimension that is way beyond others. Uh, in the middle, you see something called the N11, which I am frequently actually very embarrassed about. Uh, that sometimes journalists kind of look at this, this profound N11 thing. All it is is literally a phrase to describe the next 11 largest populated countries after the four bricks. That's it. And it's a very, not, not surprisingly, therefore, because that's the only commonality, it's a very diverse bunch. But there's no intended statement that these countries are something necessarily special other than the fact they have a lot of people. Uh, but what is intriguing that four of those, the four I mentioned, uh, I'd say put in this sort of you know, adult status, and the other seven, uh, at least today, should still be thought of as traditional emerging markets, but as though I might get into, some of them have such powerful demographics that they might themselves become of the same kind of economic importance of these eight uh, in the future. Uh, Ah, so let me go back. So hopefully uh, this p picture uh, shows uh, more, if you could see it, that was, uh, more specifically as to why I think it's so obvious that people should think a bit differently these days. This is uh, our presumption of the change in the dollar value of GDP this decade globally. And importantly, let me say before I forget to do it, if the world does something like this, contrary to the pessimism in many Western people's heads, including most of our policymakers, the world will grow by more than 4% on average this decade, if this happens. For the 30 years that I've been uh, enjoying the game as a repeated professional forecaster, the world's grown by less than 3.5%. Uh, and it is because of these growth market economies. Though in, in current dollar terms, uh, we're assuming that they will add about $15 trillion to global GDP. But in the context of, of why it's so important to think of these people differently, if you look carefully, that is more than double that of the euro area and the US combined. So. It's a real mental thing for people from my generation, particularly given the scale of challenges we have. Uh, and, uh, of course, the one that you guys are, uh, are deeply immersed in, the whole European crisis. Uh, it isn't the most important economic topic in the world. Uh, the most important topic in the world economically is how these guys can sustain what they've been doing and how we can integrate with them. And in particular... Uh, the big elephant in the room, I guess that's an Indian expression, I shouldn't use that one. The, uh, the big polar bear in the room, is that, that's not really right either, the sea. Half of that growth will be China. Uh, and let me emphasize, that is not assuming that China carries on the way that it's been. It's assuming China will grow by 8%. Uh, it has been very obvious to me now for nearly two years 
that we were entering a new phase where China deliberately wants to grow by a slower rate. And it's more obsessed about the quality of growth as opposed to the quantity. And we're seeing some of that uh, play out uh, very topically in financial markets this week. A um, couple of other things to point out from it. I, I frequently get the wonderful pearls of wisdom that when am I going to drop the R in brick because Russia is such a horrible place that doesn't justify being part of it. Uh, and, and what I often say to people, and I will now, well, when, I, when I'm allowed to stop talking about the euro area as having any existence, maybe I will. Because despite the fact we might not like how Russia is led or run, in dollar terms this decade, Russia alone will probably mean more to global GDP than the euro area. And that's assuming Russian growth of 4%. So whilst we might not like how the country is run and there's lots of problems about it and there are all sorts of issues about specific guidance and we might want to influence them, going back to where I started from, from a business perspective, if you push that kind of mental approach too far, you're not going to have many places to be doing business with. And I certainly, it is, I think, not a coincidence that a lot of those emails I get usually originate from Britain or the United States and very rarely from anybody in Germany. And that's, of course, because Germany sort of understands a bit more the importance already of Russia in terms of business. Final, final thing to say in the context of all these issues, uh, many parts of the world where I go, the first question I usually get is, what do you think about Greece? And I sometimes rudely say, not much. Um, because in a global economics context, Greece doesn't really mean much. Uh, and what I often say to people is, why don't you ask me about its neighbour, Turkey? Because Turkey will be one of the top ten probable contributors to global GDP growth. <clears throat> in that context, and making it even more specific for the year we are in, uh, to really exaggerate the scale of change, uh, let me hit you with a couple of statistics. So, so last year... Uh, the remarkable story known as China, uh, their economy went from 5.9 trillion to 7.3 trillion in one year, an increase, an increase of 1.4 trillion in one year. Uh, and I have translated that into the following to demonstrate its importance. So that means that China is creating the economic equivalent of another Greece every 11 and a half weeks. And <coughs> Wednesday that's just gone, was 11 and a half weeks of 2012. And so China's already replaced uh, China that wouldn't exist, uh, sorry, a Greece that wouldn't exist already this year. Uh, 1.4 1, 1. trillion is like creating half a United Kingdom in 12 months, or one tenth of the overall Euro area. It is an astonishing, astonishing phenomenon. Um, in a, a slightly broader context, if you look at the other three bricks as well, this year, uh, on reasonably conservative numbers, they will see their dollar GDP change by about two trillion, <coughs> possibly more. So between them, they will be close to creating uh, an additional Italy, uh, which is the eighth largest economy in the world. Uh, and that's the scale of change which uh, is going on. <coughs> Um, and the consequences of it, uh, of course, go way beyond just narrow economics and, and will increasingly touch, uh, in essence, every aspect of our lives. Uh, and certainly as it relates to the world economy, increasingly all aspects of the governance of the world economy, some of which this week are, are again, highly topical. And I use, this is what the world would look like uh, by 2020 if what I just showed you happens. And uh, the most important thing to point out here is that definitely before the end of this decade, possibly as soon as 2015, the collective size of the four BRIC countries will be bigger than the US. Uh, and it seems to me <clears throat> the kind of uh, focus that is building about the BRIC, BRICS, because South Africa's crept in there, uh, not really sure why economically, but there you go. Um, the BRICS political leaders meeting in Delhi next week 
will by then become obviously of even greater uh, geopolitical significance. Uh, and there are so many things that will flow from it. Um, one highly important one, for example, uh, I am now working on the presumption that by 2015, uh, China uh, will have adopted sufficient convertibility of the RMB that it won't be a truly floating currency in the way we're used to thinking of these things, but it will be sufficient for it to become part of the SDR basket. Uh, and that in itself has all sorts of potentially profound consequences uh, about the monetary system, not least because the Chinese will probably uh, push the notion of the SDR itself uh, playing a more central role uh, in the world monetary system than what it has done as just an accounting currency. Quite how you do that, I'm not entirely sure, but it's going to be quite intriguing to put it mildly to see. Uh, other things that follow from that, which are even more topical this week, the, the leadership of the World Bank and the IMF and the, and the effectiveness and structure of, the G, of the, all the Gs is going to have to change dramatically too. So it will no longer be a, a, a cosy deal between Washington, Berlin, Paris and Brussels as to swapping leadership for the IMF and the World Bank. And it's very interesting to see in yesterday's Financial Times uh, the BRIC leaders making noises about proposing uh, Ngozi, the Nigerian finance minister, to be their sort of chosen person. I, I think for this cycle of the World Bank change, it's, it's far too late, is what I would be my hunch, but before the decade is over, that will become a common part of, uh, of our lives and, and a justified one, in my opinion. Um, let me go forward further quickly, because I, I want to make sure I don't talk too long and... <clears throat> leave time for questions, but there's, <clears throat> there's about four other key things I need to uh, show you. Um, first of which is this one, arguably the most important. <clears throat> there are many people uh, from our generation, or my generation, again including lots of Western policymakers, uh, which I find astonishing really. <clears throat> Business people tend to be more aware than this. that They kind of think, well all of this might be great for these guys, but they're going to do it at our expense. And their growth is making our growth weaker. And part of the reason why it is because they just export to us. That sort of might have been true in the past, certainly pre-2008 <coughs> crisis with China. But it's increasingly not the case. Uh, here is a picture of what I would call global shopping. Uh, it's retail sales adjusted for inflation. And the red line is the world, and the blue line is consumer spending in these growth market economies. And the yellow line is consumer spending in the so-called advanced world. And as you can see, the red line is dominated by the, by the blue line. And uh, those of you that travel around the world, especially to prominent Western cities, with lot, I don't know what it's like here in Dublin, but any of you take a trip over to London and you happen to find a day like this, an occasional day where it's not raining in London, and if you wander down Bond Street for 10 minutes, you will see it unveiling right in front of you on, on a sunny day. You, you, occasionally, you, you would not even be able to get past the Louis Vuitton store for Chinese people busy taking pictures of their friends coming out laden with bog, bags of very expensive goods. Uh, you go to parts of Switzerland in the summer, uh, and, uh, and I've seen it myself last summer, uh, some of their resorts are completely dominated by wealthy Indians sort of playing out their Bollywood fantasies in Switzerland. Uh, and, it, and it goes on all over the world. Uh, linked to that, and a, a highly, highly important complication about European Monetary Union is this remarkable picture. This is a picture of German exports, which is a very specific example of how it is not true that all Western countries uh, have their breakfast, lunch, and dinner eaten by the BRIC countries. <clears throat> Germany, as of uh, the end of last year, now exports more to the four BRIC countries collectively than it does to France, uh, which, having spent a lot of time thinking about European Monetary Union in my career, and an organization like this one that owes its origins to some of the, those remarkably strong developments, this is a huge complication, of course. Uh, and if you roll the clock back to the mid-90s, 
if German policymakers had the slightest inkling that this could be true by now, they probably would have been even more pernickety about the circumstances for supporting the development of EMU than they are today. And certainly from a business perspective, um, lots of German companies would, would and I, I, for the people in the media here, this is a joke, by the way, um, they would willingly rather swap Greece for being in European Monetary Union with China uh, because that's how important it is, has become. And uh, at the, if the current pace were to be continued, which to complicate matters it almost definitely isn't because China's slowing down, but if it did, by the end of this year, China itself would be Germany's number one export market. Uh, and it's obviously a profoundly <coughs> important thing. Let me... Uh, go to the other three things I wanted to mention. <clears throat> um, linked to European Monetary Union, I, I like to sort of have a little game. So if you, if you imagine a world where any country could join European Monetary Union, even if they were not physically located in Europe, my eight growth economies, uh, seven of them, or six, six of them, would walk in there tomorrow on the old criteria, the ones that were supposed to be key uh, in the first place. India uh, would have to make do with a monetary union with Club Med. But all the others, uh, as I sort of jokingly say, are almost more Swiss than the Swiss, uh, which, of course, uh, is in remarkable contrast to the staggering challenges not just EMU members face, but across uh, the whole of the developed world. If you actually did a silly little game similarly like that for uh, every developed country, right now I think at best there are seven countries that satisfied the original Maastricht criteria. Finland, Slovakia, um, Australia, Sweden, Norway, Switzerland, and maybe Canada. <coughs> And the contrast with the so-called growth market economies is, is, is amazing. Um, let me finish for now, because I want to leave plenty of time with, with, with some time on, on, the, on these two pages, charts. So, so far, all I've talked to you about is all the, the, the wonderful things about all of these places. Uh, and of course, I'm sure many of you are thinking, well, Life isn't quite as simple as that, and there's all sorts of problems in all these countries, and, and, there, and, and there is. Um, for a number of years, uh, we, or my old economics group under my guidance, and I, I use it still now, uh, have, do, have, have, have calculated something we call a growth environment score, which is an index, and you can see it here, that goes from zero to 10, uh, of 13 different variables that we think are relevant for sustainable growth and productivity. Um, <clears throat> Long-term economic growth, in my opinion, is a, is, a, is a simple consequence of two things. It is as complicated and as straightforward as that. Number of people that work and their productivity. And <clears throat> so having a large number of people in the workforce makes it a bit easier to potentially grow by a strong rate. And of course, if you don't, then you can't. But the second thing is obviously the productivity of those people. Uh, and so we monitor these things really closely and we update these scores every, <clears throat> every year. In fact, my old department has just published a big, very thoughtful paper on this exact topic, including some changes to the way it's calculated. But the picture is broadly the, broadly the same. And the closer you are to 10, the better it is. And, and zero is somewhere where you don't want to be. Uh, so let me point out a few uh, quite important things. Uh, I mentioned uh, about South Korea earlier, and I said I was going to come back to it. South Korea has a, a growth environment score. And we, do, we, we do this for 183 countries, by the way. South Korea has a score... Uh, of 7.5, and actually in the updated one, 7.7. .7, the fourth highest scoring out of 183 countries. Uh, and again, taking it back to my core thesis, why on earth do we call South Korea a developing country? <clears throat> its score is, is higher than every G7 country except Canada. 
uh, and we talk about it as an emerging country. <clears throat> Second thing in that consequence, uh, for all these other countries, and, and th these 15 countries, the BRIC and the N11 countries, they are two-thirds to three-quarters of the world's population. <clears throat> they should all essentially aspire to copy what South Korea has done. Uh, because if they can do things to get their scores to South Korea's level, then they will fulfill their potential. Uh, and China will become the biggest economy in the world. India will become the second biggest economy in the world in the next 30 years. And many of these other places uh, will become really big as well. Uh, <clears throat> the next thing to point out uh, of the four BRICS, <coughs> Uh, again, linked to what I said earlier. <clears throat> Contrary to popular wisdom, Russia is not the weakest. India is the weakest. China and Brazil are sort of changed places as the, as the slightly better of the two past three years. Um, but whilst Russia has some, and I'll show you more about it in a second, some well-known, serious, specific problems... Uh, some of the things which are important for growth, in particular the use of technology, Russia is very good at. India struggles with a lot of them. India's biggest asset is that it has fantastic demographics. And the flip side of that means that if India can do just modest things to keep this GS score rising, then it will be able to grow really strongly. <clears throat> um, two other things to say before I flip forward. I find myself, uh, a wonderful aspect of how my life has evolved as, uh, in, in the middle of all of this, <clears throat> a number of the policymakers from the N11 countries these days come and visit me, uh, and they, they, they generally do two things. They try to persuade me to change the BRIC acronym to include the letter of their country. <laughs> so the Indonesians say, can you make it BRIC? Actually, at dinner last night, somebody was suggesting, why can't you make it breek with an I for Ireland? Uh, the Mexicans come and say brimk. The Turks, bricked. Uh, and, uh, and so on. Uh, and then uh, the second thing, and which is the bit that's really beautiful about it, is some of them uh, actually want to have serious conversations about what do we think they need to do uh, to grow their GS scores. Uh, and Nigeria, in particular, intrigues me of this group <clears throat> because it has a very low score, uh, but as you can see, over the past decade or so, it's doubled. Uh, and if Nigeria could sort of undertake the same progress again over the next decade, Nigeria will be a really quite significant economic force. It is 20% of Africa's population. Um, in that context, much more important globally, uh, in my opinion, than South Africa. And then finally, in, that, in, in, the, in the broader context of that, um, we have this remarkable uh, development going on across the Middle East and North Africa, of which Egypt, uh, another N11 country, is in the heart of. And I find myself thinking what, what the underlying protest in, Niger in uh, Egypt is really all about. It's not really about compared to many other Middle Eastern problems of my career, it doesn't appear to be about religion at its core uh, or anything to do with being anti-American. It seems to be that the Egyptian people want something better. And I think what they want is a better GES score. And if whatever emerges as a government uh, can deliver some of those changes, Egypt will also in the future become a pretty serious uh, seriously large economy. Uh, here are all the individual variables that matter, and I, of course you have absolutely no chance of being able to see those. I can barely see them from where I'm stood here. Um, but the, what I've just said about Nigeria, it's easy for me to say, but it's of course really difficult for them to do, because within them, and, and probably the three most difficult to change are the ones at the top, the rule of law, uh, the degree of corruption and political stability. Uh, but if these guys can get to grips in a modest way with those things, it would make a big difference because many of the other things, particularly, uh, let's call it the, te the global technology shock, is probably having a hugely positive impact uh, on some of these economies. 
And I thought in that context I'd finish with something that I hope will, will give you uh, wonderful Irish people some cheer because I suddenly realized when I was preparing for this to, I, I normally just show this picture with only two columns but intriguingly the growth environment scores for all the uh, EMU members actually have quite a lot of resonance with what's happened uh, and it, again you won't be able to see but let me uh, point out the ones I'm talking about so you will be or should be pleased to see that Ireland's score uh, is pretty high at uh, 7.4. Uh, notable distance, so way above any of the BRIC countries. In contrast, and I think sort of representative of the scale of challenge that, of why it's become such a big issue, Greece's is 5.5. Uh, and there are... There are South, not South Korea is better than most, but both China and Brazil and Vietnam have a higher GES score than Greece. Uh, and it leads me to thinking, I, 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 I apologise, it's not something I, I think about often in terms of Ireland's uh, trend growth rate, but when I think about that and when I listen to some of the stories about your demographics, uh, in terms of the big picture for Ireland, it's probably the case that I Ireland's underlying or long-term growth trend is, is higher, I'm guessing, better than, than all other uh, current EMU members. Because unlike other countries, you've got pretty good demographics as well, I think. Um, so you never know. Maybe one day it will be bleak. <laughs> I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you.